Hi beautiful people, hope you are ready for another fairy tale. This one is a fairy tale that is originated in Belgium and the guy who wrote it down is called Jean de Boschere. So, I hope you will like this. I am still working on my Josephine wall. I will be doing the last part of the horns and I'm almost, almost finished. So, the last part is the most difficult because it has been a very, very long road. So, okay, buckle up, we're going to read a story. So, this one is called Sponsken and the Giant. There was once a lad whose face was so, so badly pitted by the smallpox that everybody called him Sponsken, which means little sponge. No, it's not SpongeBob. <laughs> Sponsken. From the very day of his birth, Sponsken had been a great cause of anxiety to his parents. And as he grew older, he became more trouble still. For he was so full of whims and mischief that one never knew where one had him. He would not learn his lessons, nor work at any serious task for ten minutes on end. All he seemed to think of was cutting capers and playing practical jokes on people. At last, in despair, his parents told their trouble to the village sexton, who was a great fan friend of the family and often came to smoke his pipe with Sponsken's father in the chimney corner. Don't worry, my friends, said the sexton. I've seen young men like your son before, and they are quite easy to manage, if one only goes about it the right way. Just leave him to me. What he wants is a good fright, and I'll make it my business to see that he gets it. So far, so good. Sponsken's parents were only too glad to fall in with any plan which seemed likely to reform their unruly son, so the sexton went off to make his arrangements. That night, he whitened his face with flour, covered himself in a white sheet, and hid behind a tree on a road along which he knew Sponsken would have to pass. It was the dark of the moon, and the place the sexton had, co had chosen f was very lonely. For a long time he waited. Then, hearing Sponsken coming along, whistling a merry tune, he sprang out suddenly from behind his tree and waved his arms in a terrifying manner. Hello, said Sponsken. Who are you? The sexton uttered a hollow groan. What's the matter? said the boy. Are you ill? If you can't speak, get off, out of my way, for I'm in a hurry. The sexton groaned again, louder than before, and waved his arms wildly. Come, come, cried Sponskun. I can't stay here all night. Tell me what you want at once and let me pass. Then, as the ghostly figure made no answer, he struck it a blow with the stout stick which he carried, and the poor Saxton fell stunned to the ground. Sponskin stayed long enough to take a glimpse of the ghost's face, and to recognize the features of the Saxton beneath the flower. Then he went on his way homeward, whistling as merrily as before. When he reached his home's uh, when he reached home, his parents gazed at him uneasily. They were very anxious about the success of their friend's plan, but Sponskin did not look at all like a lad who had been frightened. Quite the contrary, in fact, for he drew his chair up to the table and set to work upon his supper, which with an excellent appetite. A funny thing happened to me tonight, he said carelessly, between two bites of an onion. As I was walking along the lonely road by the cemetery, a white figure jumped out at me. A, a, a white figure? stammered his father. 
How terrifying! And what you, did you do, my son? Do? said Sponskin cheerfully. Why, I fetched him a crack on the skull with my staff. He went down like a nine, pine, nine pin, and I warrant he won't try to frighten travelers again. Base, ungrateful boy, cried his father, rising to his feet. It was my dear friend Jan the Sexton you struck. All I hope is that you have not killed him. Well, if I have, it is his own fault, answered Sponskin. He should not play tricks on me. But his father continued to rage, to rage and grumble so long that Sponskin got tired of hearing him at last he flung off to bed in a sulk. I'll stand no more of this, he said to himself. Since my own people don't appreciate me, I'll go out and seek my own fortune in the world, and they may go on as best they can. The next morning, therefore, having packed a loaf of bread and a piece of cheese in a bag, Sponskin set off his travels, telling nobody where he was going, and taking nothing else with him except a sparrow, which he had tamed and kept since it was a fledgling. After walking for a long time he came to a forest, and feeling rather tired he sat down on the trunk of a fallen tree to rest. Now, in this forest lived a giant, who was the most hideous creature one could possibly imagine. From his forehead jutted a pair of horns. His features were more like those of a beast than of a man, and his fingernails grew long and curved like the claws of a wild animal. The giant considered himself lord of the whole wood and was very jealous, lest anybody should enter his domain. When, therefore, he saw Sponskin, he was very angry. And having pulled up a young tree by the roots to serve him as a club, he approached the young man who was sitting with his eyes closed and struck him, struck him a heavy blow on the shoulder. In spite of appearances, Sponskin was, Sponskin was not asleep. He was far too wary a person to be caught napping under such conditions. As a matter of fact, he had seen the giant before the giant saw him and he knew that his only chance of escape was to remain unperturbed and calm. When, therefore, the giant struck him on the shoulder, he opened his eyes sleepily, rubbed the place and said with a yawn, A pest on these flies, they bite so hard that a fellow can't sleep for them. You shall sleep soundly enough in a minute, muttered the giant who was enraged at Sponskin's nonchalance. See how you like this! And he gave the lad a blow on the other shoulder, harder than before. There they are again! cried Sponskin, rubbing the place. My word! They bite even harder on this side than the other. It is time I was going. And he rose from his seat, starting back with surprise, as he affected to see the giant for the first time. So it's you, is it? he cried. What do you mean by tickling me when I'm trying to sleep? If I were not so kind-hearted, I'd break your neck for you. Have a care what you say, cried the giant. Do you know that I have the strength of twenty men and could crush you between my hands like a kitten? Pooh, said Sponskin. Words are windy things. I have no doubt you could kill a whole regiment with your breath. But words won't go with me, my man. You must give me some proof of your p power. Proof? roared the giant. See here. I can throw a stone so high into the air it will not come down for a quarter of an hour. And he was good at his word, for picking up a large stone he flung it with all his strength, and it was more than a quarter of an hour before it fell again at their feet. Can you match that? asked the giant with a grin. Easily, said Sponskin. I will throw a stone so high that it will not come down at all. 
Bending to the ground, he picked up a pebble and showed it to the giant. But very cleverly, he managed at the last moment to exchange it for the sparrow, which he carried in his pocket. And this he was able to do because the giant was rather short-sighted and, if truth be told, slow-witted as well. <laughs> One, two, three, cried Sponsken. And he tossed the bird up into the air and, of course, it flew up and up and never came down at all. Well, well, said the giant. I never saw such a thing as that in my life before. You are certainly a wonderful stone thrower, little man, but can you do this? And picking up another stone, he squeezed it so hard between his immense fists that he crushed it into a fine powder. Yes, that is hard to do, said Sponskun, but I think I can go one better. Any oaf, if he be strong enough, can crush a stone to powder, but it requires skill as well as strength to wring the juice out of one. Watch me. So saying, Sponske slipped out his piece of cheese and squeezed it until the whey dripped from between his fingers. Oh, marvelous, said the giant. I confess myself beaten. Let us go into partnership, for there cannot be two others like us in the whole world. Willingly, answered Sponske. But what are we to do? Why... As for that, said the giant, the king of this country has promised, promised his daughter's hand in marriage, and a great treasure besides to anybody who can destroy three ferocious beasts which are devastating his realm. It seems to me that this is a task we can quite well do together. You with your quickness and skill can trap the beasts, and I can kill them with my club. That done, we will divide the spoils. So it was agreed, and without wasting a moment, the two took the wood together. Before very long, they reached the king's palace, and sent up a message by one of the lords in waiting that they would like to see his majesty. And do you mean to tell me, asked the king, when he heard the giant's tale, that you can overcome the three fierce animals by the help of this ugly little pock-marked fellow? Hush, not so loud for the love of heaven, whispered the giant. My friend is very touchy about his appearance, and if he hears you are making such slighting remarks, it is very likely he will bring the whole of your palace down about your head. You don't say whispered the king in reply, glancing fearfully at the terrible little man. Well, you are at liberty to try your luck. The three animals are a bear, a unicorn and a wild boar. And at present they are hidden in the wood close by. There you will find them. But take care of yourselves, for they have already killed source of my man, scores of my men. Don't be afraid, answered the giant. For us, this is an easy, as easy as playing a game. After having partaken of a good meal, the two made their way towards the wood in which the animals were hidden. We must make a plan, said Sponsken. Listen to what I propose. You go into the middle of the wood while I remain here on the outskirts. Then, when you drive the beasts out, I will see that they do not escape. So it was arranged. The giant went forward into the wood, while Sponskun remained outside, waiting to see what would happen. He had not to wait long, for presently there was a crashing and a tearing of undergrowth, and a great bear came lumbering towards him. Sponskun did not like the look of the creature at all, and decided to put as much space between them as possible. Looking here and there for a refuge, he spied a big oak tree and cl quickly climbed its trunk and 
ensconed himself among the branches. Ensconced himself? Yeah, something like that. Unfortunately, the bear had already seen him and raising himself on his hind legs with a dreadful roar, he rushed to the tree and began to climb. In another moment, Sponscon would have been lost, but by good chance, the tree happened to be hollow. So without hesitation, the lad let himself down into the trunk and finding at the bottom a small hole which led to the open air, he was just able to wriggle through and escape. The bear followed him into the hollow trunk, but the hole at the bottom was too small for him to get out, and as there was hardly room to move inside the trunk, the angry creature had to stay where he was, waking all the echoes in the forest with his growling. The next minute the giant came running out of the forest. Have you seen the bear? he cried. I drove him towards you. Don't worry, answered Sponskun coolly. I've shot him up in the tree there to keep him safe. The giant rushed to the tree and dispatched the bear with one blow of his great cup, club. Then pulling out the carcass, he shouldered it and the two went back to the palace, congratulating, congratulating each other on the excellent beginning of their enterprise. There remain no... Oh, sorry. No, wait. Pause, 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 pause. So, there remain now the unicorn and the wild boar. Next day, Sponsken and the giant went to the forest again. And since their first plan had been so successful, it was arranged that they should follow exactly the same course. The giant went into the depths of the wood to find the unicorn and drive him out, while Sponskun remained on the borders to capture the animal when he came. This time the period of waiting was longer, and Sponskun, leaning against the oak tree, had almost fallen asleep when a clattering of hoofs awakened him, and he sprang aside just in time to escape to the unicorn who, breathing fire from his nostrils, charged down upon him. So great was the impact of the beast's charge that he could not stop himself and with a mighty crash he ran full into the tree, driving his horn so far into the trunk that although he pulled and struggled he could not wrench himself free. When the giant came up, Sponskun showed him the animal which was quickly killed with a single blow of the club. Didn't I manage that affair well? asked Sponskun as they went back to the palace. You are a wonder, answered the giant, and he really believed what he said. Now only the wild boar remained, and on the following day the two went to the forest to capture him also. Once again the same plan was followed. But this time Sponskun kept his eyes wide open and when the ferocious beast broke over he ran as fast as he could into the direction of the royal chapel. The wild boar followed him and a fearsome creature he looked, I assure you, with his wicked little eyes and his great curved tusks and his hair on his back bristling like the quills of a porcupine. Through the open door of the chapel, Sponskun ran, and the boar, snorting with fury, followed him. Then began, began a fine chase, round and round the aisles, and in and out of the vestries. At last Sponskun seized a chair, and dashing it against the window, broke several panes, so made good his escape. While the boar was still standing stupidly staring at the hole through which he had gone out, Sponskun ran around to the door, which he closed and locked. So, a short time afterwards, the giant came rushing up. Where is the boar? Have you let him get away? he cried. Don't get so excited, answered Sponskun. The boar is safe enough. 
He's in the chapel there. I had no other place to put him, so I flung him through the window. What a wonderful little man you are, said the giant gleefully, and he ran off to kill the boar with one blow of his club. This done, he hoisted the carcass, carcass on his shoulders and took the road to the palace. Halfway there, the weight of the boar began to tell, for it was a massive beast and the giant was forced to stay and rest. It is all very swell, said he, mopping his streaming brow, but I think you ought to take a turn with me in carrying that carcass. Not I, answered Sponskun. We made an agreement that my work was done when I captured the beast and I intend to keep to it. So the giant had to struggle on as best it he could, as he could for the rest of the way, grumbling at every step while Sponskun followed, laughing up his sleeve and exceedingly thankful he had ex escaped the task. When they reached the palace, the two presented themselves before the king and claimed the promised reward. But now a difficulty arose. It was quite easy to divide the treasure, but which of them was to have the princess? I think it should be I, said the gi giant, for I killed the three animals. Not at all, said Sponskun. The princess should be given to me, for I captured the beasts. A lot of good your capturing them would have been if I had not killed them, said the giant. How could you have killed them if I had not caught them first, answered Sponskun. And so the two began to quarrel and neither would give way and high words passed between them. Truth to tell, the king was not at all sorry that a dispute as had arisen, for he did not very much relish the idea of his daughter marrying either the bestial giant or the pockmarked ugly little fellow who was his companion. There is only one way out of the difficulty, said the king at last. We must let fate decide. Listen to the plan I propose. You shall both of you sleep in the princess's chamber tonight. The giant's in a bed on one side of her couch and Sponskun on the other. I also will remain in her chamber and watch her carefully. If she spends most of the night with her face turned towards Sponskun, it shall be a sign that she is going to marry him. If, on the other hand, she favors the giant, he shall be her husband. But if she sleeps all night with her face towards neither of you, then you must both give her up and be satisfied with the treasure. So it was agreed, and that night a trial took place. Sponskun, however, did not by any means intend that blind chance should settle so important a matter, and he spent the intervening time in making certain preparations. First of all, he went to the palace gardens, from which he gathered certain herbs having an arom aromatic and beautiful perfume. These he placed in a bag and hid under his clothes. Then from the woods he gathered all the herbs he could find with a de disagreeable smell, such as garlic and stinkwort and poisonous fungus. These also he placed in a bag and seized an early opportunity when they came to the princess's chamber of hiding the bag under the pillow on which the giant's head was to rest. The princess well knew the fateful issue which was to be decided in the night, and she had firmly, firmly made up her mind not to marry either the one or the other of her suitors. She determined to remain awake all night and to take care to keep her face turned toward the ceiling. For a time she managed to, to do so, but before long drowsiness overcame her and she slept. Presently she turned over on her left side and lay with her face turned towards the giant, who began to chuckle to himself. 
Wait a minute, thought Sponskum. I don't think the princess will keep that position long. And sure enough, the horrible stench of the herbs in the bag beneath the giant's pillow penetrated even to her dreams, and the princess turned over hurriedly on the other side. What a chance, a change was there. Instead of disgusting smells, which made her dream of gloomy and noisome things, she found now a delicious perfume that brought pictures of sunlit gardens and glowing with flowers and bright winged butterflies flitting over them. The princess gave a little sigh of content, and for the rest of the night she remained with her face towards Sponskun so that the king had no choice but to declare the little man the winner. The princess, however, refused to abide by the judgment. I will not marry that vulgar fellow. I will die first. Oh, father, if you love me, think of means of escape. Do not be afraid, my child, answered the king. I will arrange something. And the next day he took the giant aside and proposed to him that he should rid him of Sponskin, promising a rich reward for his service. The giant's greed was aroused, and being very jealous of his companion's success, he was the more ready to fall in with the king's suggestion. Fortunately for himself, Sponskin's quick wits had made him suspicious. He guessed that some treachery was afoot, and in order to be prepared, prepared for an emergencies, he took a heavy hammer and he retired to bed at night. His suspicions were justified, for towards midnight the door of his room opened and the giant entered on tiptoe, carrying a heavy axe with which he intended to dispatch of our friend. No sooner was his foot inside the door, however, that Sponskin jumped out of bed and sprang at him, looking so fierce that the giant, who was a coward at heart, and had besides a healthy respect for his companion's powers, turned and fled in dismay. Then Sponskin lifted his heavy hammer and struck three res resounding blows upon the floor. The noise awoke everybody in the palace and servants and guards and lords in waiting came flocking to the room to discover the cause. The king came last of all, a little anxious about the success of his fine plot, and when he found Sponskin sitting up in bed quite unharmed, his face fell. What's the matter? he stammered. Matter? answered Sponskin. Nothing very much. Some person wandered into my room, so I just gave three taps with my fingers on the wall. It is lucky for you all that I did not strike the blows with my fist, for had I done so, I'm afraid there would be nothing left of your, of your palace but a heap of dust. At these words, everybody turned pale, and the king made haste to protest his undying friendship for his terrible guest. As for the giant, he was in such fear of encountering Sponskin's resentment that he fled and nobody ever saw him again. Now the poor king did not know what to do, for his daughter still persisted in, his refu in her refusal to marry Sponskin, and he was torn two ways by love and fear. Yes. Just at that time, however, a neighboring monarch, who was an old enemy of the king's, declared war upon him, and this offered him another op opportunity for delay. <laughs> Calling Sponskin before him, the king proposed that he should prove his failure by challenging the enemy king to mortal combat. Sponskin agreed but his fame had already been noised abroad and the challenge was refused. Very well, said the king, who was at the end of his resources. As my prospective son-in-law, you ought to lead my armies into battle. 
I will place my own charger at your disposal and I look to you to save my country from defeat. He was, here was a pretty kettle of fish. Sponsken had never ridden a horse in his life and he had not the slightest knowledge of warfare. To make matters worse, worse the steed in question was a notoriously fictitious Oof. Again, drink. Sorry. So, to make matters worse, the steed in question was a notoriously vicious brute who would allow nobody but his own master to mount him. Already, he had accounted for several grooms and stablemen who he had kicked to death. Sponsken commanded that the steed should be led to the borders of the forest and tied by the bridle to a tree. He had not the slightest intention of trying to mount a brute, and his plan was to wait until the attendants had gone away and then to slip off unobserved. Fate, however, was too much for him, for hardly was the horse safely tied up then Curius came springing out of the road to see to say that the enemy king was advancing at the head of his army and was at that very moment less than half a mile away away all the attendants fled at once and Sponsken himself was so overcome by terror without thinking what he was doing he jumped upon the back of the steed and Forgetting that he was tied of to a tree, dug his sharp spurs into his side. The horse plunged and reared, champing at the bit and doing its best to dislodge Sponscombe from the saddle. But the lad clung on for dear life. At last, finding all its efforts unveiling, the horse dragged the tree up by the roots and charged forward in a straight line towards the advancing enemy. Almost dislodged from his seat by the sudden jerk, Sponskin stretched out his hand and grasped the branches of the tree, which swung in a terrifying manner at his side, promising every moment to hurl him from the saddle, and the result was that the enemy army to the enemy army it appeared as though he were charging down upon them at full speed bearing a tree as a club. Filled with dismay at the terrifying sight, the soldiers of the enemy king fled in all directions and hid themselves in the woods and in the uh, crevices of the rock. Crevices of the rock. Sponskin rode on for the simple reason that he could do nothing else right into the enemy's camp, where the steed came to a standstill and our hero was able to jump down from its back. Entering the king's tent, he helped himself to all the documents and articles of value. And then, having cut the tree from the bridle, he remounted the horse, which was now quite tame and, yeah, he rode back to the palace. When the king heard that the enemy was rooted, he was overjoyed, and he recognized that the man who could perform such a feat single-handed was not to be treated, li treated lightly. His daughter, however, was still firm in her refusal to marry Sponskin, and so the king made him an offer of half his kingdom if he would release him from his promise and allow the princess to go free. Sponskin accepted and married a girl who, although she was not a princess, was nevertheless very pretty. Their wedding was celebrated with great pomp, and they lived together very happily for the rest of their lives. So, ha! Great, big, bizarre story, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's a Belgium story. Um... How much time do I have left? An half an hour. But I might leave you with this, guys, because 
my husband is making spaghetti and uh, it's six o'clock already and i think i should check on my children because one of them still has to make homework yeah and today i set up my greenhouse so i'm pretty tired myself tomorrow i will be sowing all my vegetables that i wanted to sow in my greenhouse so um i hope you've enjoyed this little story and um, please leave a comment and if you haven't subscribed yet consider subscribing and um, hit the, I'm sorry see I cannot think I'm so tired hit the notification bell to be notified when I put up another video and um, I think next video will be just a simple unboxing but right now I'm gonna go and I hope you have a really, really, really awesome day and hope to see you in the next video, guys and girls and women and men. Thank you so much for watching. Have a really great day. Bye.